Let's pray together. Lord, we're so thankful for the name of Jesus. For Lord, we know that that is the only name under heaven given among men whereby we may be saved. We're so thankful for the name of Jesus, for the day is coming when at that precious and holy name every knee shall bow and every tongue confess in heaven and on earth and under the earth that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And Lord, in this sacred moment, we freely confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And we pray, Lord, that your lordship would grow ever more impactful and effective in our lives, Lord, as we trust you more today than we did yesterday, as we follow you more closely in coming days as we have before. Lord, we surrender ourselves yet again to you, saying that you are our Lord and you give us hope. And so, Lord, now through your word and by your spirit, speak to our hearts Transform us by the renewing of our minds. Make us more like Jesus. For it's in that precious and holy name that we pray. Amen. I think one of the most loving things that anybody can do is to give us a warning. But it doesn't, it doesn't always feel loving, does it? How many of you have ever received a warning from somebody that you did not appreciate at the time? Has that ever happened to you? I, there was one day, and, and quite honestly, I had just conducted a graveside service at the cemetery, and a buddy of mine who works there at the cemetery, he and I had gone to high school together. I was getting ready to leave, and, and he flagged me down and told me to stop. And he said, you're missing a couple of lug nuts off one of your wheels. And it annoyed me. But I was glad he told me because that could have turned pretty rough pretty quick. Or maybe Siri gives you warnings occasionally. How many of you travel with Siri now? You know, used to, to go on a trip, you had to get out your big old Rand McNally Atlas and you had to plot it out. You remember that? I mean, I would take a highlighter. And I would, the first time I went to Florida by myself to the panhandle, there's a lot of twists and turns you've got to get in there. Now, now Siri tells us, I promise you if Siri ever goes away, none of us are going to be able to get anywhere. There are times when I'm traveling in this city where I have lived for 41 years and I have Siri tell me where to go. But there was a day that I was trying to get somewhere quick. I was in a hurry, and that happened sometimes for me. And Siri told me that just down the road there was a wreck and that I needed to change my route. And I was deeply annoyed because I was in a hurry and I didn't want to listen to Siri. But I got off at the exit and I was able to get there only, only with a slight delay, and I was thankful for that warning. Or, honestly, probably the warning that shook me more than any was within the wake of my father's passing. Dad died at age 56, which every day that passes for me gets younger and younger and younger. And I went to the doctor because I was dealing with some symptoms that I thought might need to be addressed. Honestly, my wife thought that they might need to be addressed. Husbands, how many of you are thankful that we have women who make us go to things like doctor's visits? Well, I got in there, and Dr. Burt... He's now retired, but he was my physician from age 3 to age 39. He looked at me, and he put his hands on my face. And if you know Dr. Burt, you know that that is not out of character. And he pulled me in close and got right in my face, and he said, if you don't lose weight, you're going to die. I did not appreciate his warning. In fact, I left that doctor's office so mad, I was fuming. I called my wife. I said, you're never going to believe what he told me. But you know, the issue wasn't him. I wasn't mad at him. I was mad at me. And he was giving me a warning that I needed to heed, and I'm thankful that he put his hands on my face and told me that because that gave me some motivation to change some things about my life. And that's resulted in utter transformation in me, and I'm so thankful for it. You know, one of the most loving things we can do is to warn people when we see danger ahead. Every good coach warns his or her players about what could happen if they don't course correct. Every good teacher warns his or her students about what could happen if they don't change some things. Every parent that is worthy of being a parent in any regard spends a lot of time warning their kids about potential dangers that they see coming. If you don't do that, that's evidence that you don't love those kids. And so one of the most loving things I believe we can do is to warn people when we see impending danger for them, and Jesus loved us more than all. 
And in Mark chapter 13, he is going to issue a warning both to his disciples and those gathered in that space and in that time, but also to us. So I want to invite you to turn with me to Mark chapter 13. We're going to look at verses 19 through 37. And if you're in the Red Pew Bible in front of you, that is page 850 page 850. As you turn there, I'll tell you that Jesus is speaking really about two events that are going to happen. He speaks largely in the first part of Mark chapter 13 about events that are going to transpire in AD 70. Now, they don't know this yet. They don't know the year that this is going to happen, but the, the temple is going to be destroyed in AD 70. And Jesus speaks to great length at the destruction of the temple and what's going to come within the lifetime of those who are gathered there, but then he also speaks about the end of the age, about the end of time. And he warns all of us that a day is coming when the day of mercy will come to an end and the day of judgment will come. And that warning may bother you. That warning has bothered me. But one of the most loving things we can do is to warn people about what is to come so that they might turn and live. So Mark chapter 13, our theme for the message today is Jesus warned all. Jesus warned all. Look with me at verse 19. For in those days there will be such tribulation as has not been from the beginning of creation that God created until now and never will be. And if the Lord had not cut short the days, no human being would be saved. But for the sake of the elect whom he chose, he shortened the days. Our first point today is this. Jesus warned all that tribulation would come. Jesus warned all that tribulation would come. Now, maybe, just maybe, you're getting ready to get out your notepad and say, all right, Jeff's going to tell us which camp he's in. He's either pre-mill, post-mill, or on-mill. He's either dispensational or traditional. He's either pre-trib, mid-trib, or post-trib. I'm not telling you any of that. Because I believe faithful students of Scripture can embrace many of those positions, although I will say not all. But here's what I am going to tell you, that the end will come, and as the end approaches, tribulation will increase. Let me give you a couple of different places where Jesus promised this, Mark 13, verses 7 and 8. When you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. This must take place, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places. There will be famines. These are but the beginning of the birth pangs. In Luke's gospel, he records that Jesus said, and there will be signs in the sun and the moon and the stars and on the earth, distress of nations in perplexity because of the roaring of the sea and the waves. People fainting with fear and with foreboding of what is coming on the world. For the powers of the heavens will be shaken. You know, Jesus talks about widespread, widespread disease and, and pestilence. Well, surely we're beyond that. I mean, it's 2022. I can't imagine a world in which we talk about worldwide disease and pestilence in the last couple of years. Can you? Or what about the Bowling Green bubble? If you've lived here long enough, you've heard about the Bowling Green bubble. That's this idea that there is some protective covering over Bowling Green and Warren County that severe weather will not hit. And in my lifetime, really, I mean, we had a tornado back in the 90s. We had the, the hailstorm in the 90s. But a lot of times when, when my friend Chris Allen would say, it's coming our way, what would happen? It would go around us, and we would say, ah, oh, the Bowling Green bubble. Well, what have we learned this year? The Bowling Green bubble doesn't exist. And just like every other human being on a on the planet in a sin-fallen world, we are susceptible to natural disasters. Or what about this? I can remember being a kid when a president of the United States of America stood at a podium in front of a wall and said, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall against his speechwriter's better wishes. And I can remember my dad's joy when that wall came tumbling down. Do you remember that? You remember the Berlin Wall came down and, and and we had reached a period of tranquility and peace, and never again would we discuss the possibility of nuclear war. I'm glad we're past that, right? Well, it seems like all of our efforts to usher in peaceful perfection have failed, and they continue to fail. Do you know why they continue to fail? 
Because you and I can't usher in peaceful perfection. There is only one, and it will take his coming, his return, the judgment of the world and the gathering of God's people. That's what Jesus is talking about. So don't be surprised at tribulation. Be prayerful. Pray for all the things that he mentioned, wars, rumors of wars, pestilence, famine. Pray for all of that. Seek to be the hands and feet of Jesus, to be, to be instruments of peace in the midst of all of that. But don't be shocked about it. Our Lord told us it was coming. There would be tribulation. Jesus warned us of that. Well, now look with me at verses 21 through 23. And then if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ, or look, there he is, do not believe it. For false Christs and false prophets will arise and perform signs and wonders to lead astray, if possible, the elect. But be on guard. I have told you all things beforehand. Second point this morning is this. Jesus warned all that deception would come. Jesus warned all that deception would come. Matthew actually records a little bit more detail as Jesus' words here in Matthew 24, verses 23 through 38. He says, Then if anyone says to you, Look, here is the Christ, or there he is, don't believe it. For false Christs and false prophets will arise and perform great signs and wonders so as to lead astray, if possible, even the elect. See, I've told you beforehand. So if they say to you, look, he is in the wilderness, do not go out. If they say, look, he's in the inner rooms, don't believe it. For as the lightning comes from the east and shines as far as the west, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. Wherever the corpse is, there the vultures will gather. So I have to tell you, if you are concerned that you have missed or will miss the return of Christ, you need to understand nobody's going to miss the return of Christ. It'll be like one of those springtime thunderstorms where the lightning stretches out. You know what I'm talking about? You, you know the storms where the, the lightning makes it bright as the noonday sun, and it stretches, and, and people on every side of the county knows that the lightning has struck? That's what he says as the, as the lightning stretches out. You're not going to miss it. So when people come and say, I am Christ returned, do not be deceived. You say, well, would anybody do that? Well, Several people have. A guy named Baha'u'llah, Sun Myung Moon, Jim Jones, David Koresh, Marshall Applewhite, and there will be others. I've always been horrifyingly fascinated with how the People's Temple could result in the tragedy that happened in Guyana, November the 18th, 1978. How in the world could more than 900 people murder their children and kill themselves at the word of a cult leader? Well, it's because they were looking for hope. And Jim Jones told them, I'm where your hope is found. Can I tell you, there's no preacher that's going to be where your hope is found. Please never put your hope in Jeff Reynolds. I will fail you every single time. Don't put your hope in Christian celebrities. I had somebody come to me melting down a couple of years ago because a lot of Christian musicians were saying they weren't Christians anymore. And how could this happen? I'll tell you how it could happen. Because people will jump into fame and fortune in whatever way they can get in. And sometimes they can't make it in the mainstream, so they go to the Christians and the Christians love them, but they're not even Christians in the first place. They can just speak the language. Don't put your hope in another human being. Listen, even if you're married to him or her, they will let you down. And Jesus says, listen, when people come, and say, I'm the Christ, and you hear somebody say, look, there he is, or your Facebook feed says, we found the one. Listen, you're not going to miss the return of Jesus. Nobody is. As the lightning spreads across the sky, think about that this spring. As the lightning spreads across the sky, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. So Jesus warned that deception would come. He warned that deceivers would come. So be on guard, but know that you're not going to miss it or mistake it. It will be abundantly clear. Verse 24, but in those days after that tribulation, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light and the stars will be falling from heaven and the powers in the heavens will be shaken and then they will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory and then he will send out the angels and gather his elect from the four winds and from the ends of the earth to the ends of heaven. From the fig tree, learn its lesson. 
As soon as its branch becomes tender and puts out its leaves, you know that summer is near. So also, when you see these things taking place, you know that he is near at the very gates. Truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. Our third point, Jesus warned that the Son of Man would come. Jesus warned all that the Son of Man would come. And when you see generation there, that word in the original language can mean generation, race, family. Okay, so there were things that were going to happen within the context of the generation that was there. The temple would be destroyed in 70 A.D. But this race of human beings of which we are all a part continues on today, and it has for thousands of years. But I want you to hear that Jesus said he would come. And I want to give you some sense of the number of times Jesus said he would come. Matthew 24, 44, Therefore you also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. Matthew 26, 64, But I tell you, from now on you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. 1 Thessalonians 4, 16, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God. Revelation 1, 7, Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And all the tribes of the earth will wail on account of him. Even so, amen. Revelation 22, 7, And behold, I am coming soon. Blessed is the one who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. Revelation 22, 12, Behold, I am coming soon, bringing my recompense with me to repay each one for what he has done. Revelation 22, 20, He who testifies to these things says, Surely I am coming soon. Jesus repeatedly promised he would return. You say, preacher, do you believe in a real bodily return of Christ? Unequivocally, yes, and you should too. He's coming, and the point of his coming will be to gather his church and to judge the world. He will gather those who have repented of sin and placed saving faith in Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior, and he will judge those who have not. Because you have to decide where your judgment will go. Will your judgment be poured out on the sinless Son of God who died in your place to pay the price for your sin? Or will your judgment be poured out on you? Those are the two options. You say, I don't like those two options. You know what God says about what we like and don't like? He really doesn't care. God is not a democracy. God is not a republic. God is a theocracy. He says it is, and we obey. We choose not to obey, and we deal with the consequences. But when Christ returns, that will be incredibly hopeful for all of us who trust and follow Jesus. That's going to be a great day. Oh, we who have bowed on our knees multiple times to proclaim Jesus Christ as Lord to the glory of God the Father, just as our choir just sang, that will be the most welcome day in all of human history for our salvation will be at hand. And for those who are not in Christ, well, it'll be a lot like when the door to the ark was closed and the springs of the earth burst open and the floods came. And I promise you there were people wanting in the ark once the floods came. But the day of mercy had come to an end. The door was closed and the day of judgment had come. The day of mercy is now and until that moment when Christ returns or your life on this earth comes to an end. But at some point, at an hour you do not know, either your journey on this earth will come to an end. And how many of you have found it can come unexpectedly? In this room, on Friday, I officiated the funeral service of a woman two years older than me. She's now in glory because she'd given her life to Jesus Christ, but she was not expecting to be in glory today. It can come. But Jesus also said that he will return at an hour you do not know. And on that day, in that moment, the day of mercy will come to an end and the day of judgment will begin. And at that time, I promise you that there will be people crying out for mercy, but the day of mercy will have come to an end. But be encouraged, the day of mercy is now. 
Today, the Bible says, is the day of salvation. If you have yet to place your faith in Jesus Christ, why would you live in hell one more millisecond? For those of us who are in Christ, it will be the most welcome sight the world has ever known. And for those who are not in Christ, it will be the most fearful reality the world has ever known. For God will judge, and he will judge according to his standard. He will not put it to a vote. He will not ask nine justices what they think. He will not ask the House of Representatives what they think. He won't even ask the Senate what they think. There will be no executive order that can stay his hand. He won't care what the U.N. has to say. He will judge according to his standard. Where are you? Have you repented of sin, turning away from your sin, and turned toward Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, saying, Jesus, I'm a sinner, but you're the Savior. I turn away from my sin and ask you to come into my life to forgive me, to be my personal Lord and Savior. I promise you not everybody in this room has done that. I promise you not everybody watching what's going on in this room right now has done that. And the Bible says today is the day of salvation. For the Son of Man will come at an hour we do not know. Verse 32. But concerning that day or that hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. Be on guard. Keep awake. For you do not know when the time will come. It is like a man going on a journey when he leaves home and puts his servants in charge, each with his work, and commands the doorkeeper to stay awake. Therefore stay awake, for you do not know when the master of the house will come, in the evening or at midnight or when the rooster crows or in the morning, lest he come suddenly and find you asleep. And what I say to you, I say to all, stay awake. How many of y'all remember Mr. Getty's Pizza here in town? That's where I worked all through high school. Started my freshman year on New Year's Eve. Lost a girlfriend because of it. She didn't want her boyfriend to be working. So she broke up with me, but I went to work anyway. And I worked there until the day I left for college to go report for football camp at Center College in Danville, Kentucky. I spent a lot of hours there. But you know, if you eat the same food over and over, eventually you get tired of it. And I thought it was pretty good. And by that time, I was making pizzas, and I was pretty good at it. And I got in trouble for food costs all the time. If you can find you a cook that gets in trouble for exceeding food costs, you're going to have a good meal. But we had grown tired of the pizza. We'd had all we wanted. So when the manager left one day, we decided we would call another pizza place and have them deliver it to the front door. <laughs> to the checkout register. So with a restaurant full of people, here comes this, I won't mention the place, here comes this pizza delivery guy with a very perplexed look on his face pushing open the door to Mr. Getty's and walking up to the register and saying, I have a pizza for y'all. And the, the register worker, the cashier, paid him, not from the register because that would be illegal, but paid him our money. And we went back to one of the party rooms to sit down and enjoy what we deemed in that moment to be better pizza because we were sick of Mr. Getty's pizza. And then the manager walked in that room. <laughs> That was a bad day. <laughs> I won't repeat here what he said because I'd like to keep my job, but <clears throat> it wasn't good because we thought we could sneak by, have a little fun, have a little moment, and all would be well, but the, the boss returned at an hour of which we were unaware, and it did not end well. That's the exact same parable Jesus is teaching here. It's like a man who went away on a journey and he entrusted his property to his servants. And they decided, well, he's delayed. We've got time to have some fun. And then he comes back. Let me ask you a question. Where are you with Jesus? Because he's coming back. We don't know when. The other reality is this. Steve Ayers said this one time when I was 17 years old. And it has stuck with me ever since. He said, if you could show me an expiration date on the bottom of your foot, I would calm down with the gospel. But since you can't show me an expiration date on the bottom of your foot, that means you don't know when your finish line will come, and you had better be connected to Jesus today. Because once that finish line comes, the day of mercy is over. 
and the day of judgment comes. Are you connected to Jesus? Now, some of you may be in this room and say, well, I've been coming to church for 70 years. Good for you. You know you can go to church for 70 years and still go to hell because it's not about going to church. Is going to church a great thing? Unequivocally, yes. I make my children come every single Sunday and Wednesdays and other times when the doors are open. But it's not about your performance. It's about your surrender to Jesus. Have you surrendered your life to Jesus? And Jesus, I'm a sinner, but I believe you're the Savior. Come into my life. Forgive me of my sin. I make you Lord of my life, and I receive you as my Savior. If you've never committed your life to Christ, today's the day of salvation because you don't have an expiration date on the bottom of your foot. You don't know when it's coming. And you don't know when that trumpet will blow in the eastern sky and usher in the return of Christ. You know, he entered Jerusalem on a donkey. He will return on a great white stallion. He entered as a poor, humble, marginalized Galilean peasant. He will return as king of kings and lord of lords. And at his name, every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. For all of us who have freely bowed our knee and made that confession before his return, it will be the most welcome day we've ever seen. And for those who have never bowed their knee and made that confession at his return, they will, but it will be through gritted teeth, for they will know that the hour of judgment has come. Where are you today? Father, we love you, and we thank you so much for sending Jesus and your great love for us. We know that you sent Jesus to all people, that whosoever believeth in you should not perish, but have everlasting life, such that anyone who will come to you in repentance and faith can be forgiven of their sin, be cleansed of their unrighteousness, and be brought into the family of God by your grace. And so, Lord, in this moment, if anybody has yet to give their life to you, I pray that right now they would stop and say, Jesus, I'm a sinner, but I believe you're the Savior. Come into my life. Forgive me of my sin. I trust you. I will follow you. I make you my personal Lord, my personal Savior. And Lord, for all of us who have come to that beginning moment, as we seek to continue to trust you and to follow you in the power of your Holy Spirit, we pray that you would remind us that we have been transformed to become more like you in every way. And we're all on a journey. You're taking things out of us and putting living things in us and making us more like Jesus every step along the way. And so, Lord, we surrender ourselves to you yet again that we might trust you and that we might obey you.